Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Let's give her one big hand here. Whoa. Yeah. It's always a real joy to have you here with us. And I love the, your beautiful voice and the selections that you bring. We are so fortunate as our band exits. I just want to say, yay, our band. Yay. <laughs> We'll have an opportunity to thank them while they're here. <laughs> um, but I was, I was really noticing how nice it is to, um, to see the band playing together and, and the music that they've been selecting and the way they've been working together collaboratively. You know, just, I get all excited when I see people collaborating. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. The reason is that there's a... There's, there's some bigger thing that happens when we work together, when we surrender our individuality and, but bring our uniqueness to a team and that team ends up performing in a way that is bigger than the parts of the whole. So um, I'm, I'm, it just makes me happy. So it's, it's a Super Bowl Sunday, yes. And for us, that means soup. So <laughs> hopefully you've brought some canned goods. We're, I noticed when I brought my canned goods in this morning, the barrel was getting quite full. Um, and so uh, no worries if you didn't bring your stuff in this week. I think, are we doing it for two weeks, Clark? Yep. Yeah, yep. So there'll be one more Sunday that you can help fill up that barrel if you forgot your canned goods, and we'll be d donating them to FAM. It's also, um, you know, Valentine's week. And, you know, it's one of my favorite times of the year when we really begin to appreciate and look at the different places where we can lean into love, right? And uh, Black History Month. And so this month we are looking at black history. We have this opportunity to, um, to really dive deep into black history. And I, I watched... Dr. Andriette, who wrote the guides this month, um, Dr. Andriette Earle, she's written, she's taken a really deep dive into um, black history. And one of the things she said, I watched her talk on sun last Sunday, and she talked about the process of developing these guides. It was, it's not an easy task to be this vulnerable, to speak about something that can, is still very ouchy for a lot of people, and, um, and to include, you know, and to talk about it in a way that not only celebrates black history, but also supports our teaching. And so it, you know, we should give her a hand, even though she's not here. <laughs> and, and one of the things that she said in her talk last Sunday was that Ameri um, black history is American history. Black history is American history, and it got me thinking that maybe that's part of the divide, that we haven't embraced our shared history yet. We have the history that um, we were brought up with that isn't always accurate, that is sometimes a little glorified. And then we have some of the things that happened. I mean, change and growth and evolution are uncomfortable, and we're talking about that this month. We're talking about the divine discomfort. And our history is full of that. And so my goal is to be more aware and more awake, to be available to our shared history, to see others who might not be recognized in our shared history, and to honor all the individuals that brought us to this place where we continue to uh, grow, when we continue to find those places of uh, shared, uh, sh shared past together. So, as promised, I'm going to read a, another uh, reading from the, the Daily Guides from the Science of Mind magazine, and this is um, yesterday's reading. I, I was especially touched by this. There are two quotes. The first one is by South Carolina State Representative Doug Brannon, and he, he's quoted as saying, 
When my friend was assassinated for being nothing more than a black man, I decided it was time for that thing to be off the state house grounds. It's not just a symbol of hate, it's, an actu it's actually a symbol of pride in one's hatred. She quotes Ernest Holmes as saying, in gladness then we should make known our desires and in confidence we should wait upon the perfect law of manifestation through us. Our part is to be ready and willing to be guided into truth and liberty. And so, she, so Dr. Andriette writes, remember Bree Newsom who climbed the flagpole at South Carolina Capitol to remove a Confederate flag on June 27, 2015? Newsom had many allies on her way to that flagpole and on the day she demonstrated such immense courage, allies taught her how to climb the flagpole. Advocates arrived with bail money when she was arrested. Known and unknown, co-conspirators were in the crowd. And as the police arrived to arrest Newsom, they approached the flagpole with tasers. Seeing this situation about to unfold, a white man placed his hand on the flagpole and stared into the eyes of the white police officers. This man knew that his privilege would interrupt the plan and keep Newsom safe. In that moment, this unknown man was a co-conspirator. Action is different between an ally. Action is the difference between an ally and an advocate. Assuming personal risk is the mark of a co-conspirator. This inspires me to update the quote, when you see something, say something, to when you know something, do something. Our superpower is, is in knowing. We believe and know that all people are incarnations of the one spirit and that each of us has an essential role to play in calling forth the greater good and a world that works for all. Newsom unhooked the flag from the pole and passed it to the white man, James Tyson. Then she made it down to the ground. Police officers arrested them. When she uh, made it down to the ground, police officers arrest, arrested them. She recited the 23rd Psalm as they were taken to jail. A powerful example of doing something, knowing the right thing to do in the right moment. And so I encourage us to, to have our awareness up at all times, not just in February when it's Black History Month, not when we're recognizing Indigenous People Day, not when we're celebrating some other way of honoring all the different people that make up this country, but every day if we can look for opportunities to be the body temple of love and to have compassion for one another and find ways to support each other, we'll be walking our talk and living this philosophy. So, <laughs> today um, we are continuing with this idea of a grand rising. That's the theme for the entire year. It's our opportunity to raise up, to raise our awareness, to raise up our actions, to continue to rise up in ways that are supportive and that are, we can walk out this philosophy in real, tangible ways. And the monthly theme, as I've already said, is divine discomfort. And today's topic is where comfort ends, transformation begins, right? And oftentimes, we are brought out of our comfort zone by change. Anybody here walk into the sanctuary and notice it's a little different? Your favorite seat might be gone, right? <laughs> we've, we've changed things up a little bit. Now, that's a really benign sense of discomfort. But at every time we have that space that we can inhabit where things have changed and, and we can be curious, curious about our own reactions to it, curious about the, the ways it makes us feel, curious about some of the knee-jerk reactions we might have <laughs> to that change. You know, maybe we start grumbling to a friend about it or, 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 or if we don't like it, we start talking it down. That's human nature, 
Any, I mean, I do that, right? When, so things, when things happen that I don't like, I end up whining about it, right? <laughs> it's kind of what we do. But, but this idea of looking at our comfort zone and looking at how we can expand it, these, all these minor discomforts are great ways to begin to practice pushing our comfort zone, begin to look at where we, um, we might need to stretch a little bit. Thomas Merton is quoted as saying, what you fear is an indication of what you seek. What you fear is an indication of what you seek. And so if you think about it, if perhaps one of your fears is being alone, clearly what you might be seeking is connection. And if one of your fears is something like uh, lack of not having enough money to pay your bills, well, obviously the, the, the upside of that, the thing that you're really seeking, is greater abundance and prosperity. The things that we fear, the things that challenge us, challenge us are the opportunities for us to sort of, you know, peek underneath the hood and see what it is that we really want as opposed to giving power to the fear. And so we can heed that beautiful quote by Merton and look at fear as an opportunity as opposed to something that's going to inhibit us, <clears throat> something that's going to hold us back. I want to share a slide with you about change. Here we have a seed in the ground. Ah, this is the life. I could stay here forever. <laughs> Wait, what's, what's happening to me as the seed begins to crack open? And then as it bursts open, oh, God, the pain, kill me now. <laughs> and then as the plant reaches the sunlight, huh. Anybody have this experience with change? <laughs> yeah, huh, oh, it's okay, I didn't die. <laughs> I wasn't destroyed. But it can feel like that. It can really feel like that when we step out of our comfort zone and we begin to um, stretch. We begin to embrace the newness. It feels uncomfortable. It feels like everything doesn't fit together. That's the experience that I've had when I have to move into change, that I, you know, it takes me a little bit to get the new rhythm down, the new dance steps, if you will, with whatever is shifting in my life. And yet, it is the very cracking open, like this little seed, it's that cracking open that gives us an entree into some newness, into something that's being called forward. And so we don't want to have fear be the thing that holds us back. As a matter of fact, uh, Ernest Holmes, it's one of my favorite sections of the book. I remember stumbling across it. It's back in the general summary on page 404. And Ernest Holmes begins to talk about fear. He talks about our experience of it and how we can navigate it. He says, fear blocks the more compassion complete givingness of the spirit to its highest form of manifestation on this planet, which is mankind. Fear arises from that mental attitude that limits the possibility of the willingness of spirit to give us the good we so greatly desire. So if, if we find ourselves in that place of fear, oftentimes there's a contraction that happens. And if we are all expressions of the one life and that one divine wisdom that wants to experience life by means of us, when we contract, expression is a little more challenging for spirit, isn't it? And so fear is this opportunity for us to open up, to be available. And he says, in, you know, in my interpretation of these couple of pages, he talks about four different actions that we can take, four different things we can do to deal with fear. He's, he talks about or writes, we should contact a larger field of faith. So he brings us to this idea of having faith and understanding that there's a faith that's going to uh, lighten our load or show us the way, give us a better 
um, vantage point and perspective. He says, this is done by understanding that God is the giver and the sustainer of human life and expression. God is all there is. God is substance and supply. We must learn to accept this. It is God's pleasure to give us the kingdom. And if that is so, it is our pleasure and privilege to accept it. He goes on to talk about the importance of knowing, knowing what it is that that we know. Because sometimes we forget what we know when we're faced with fear, don't we? Sometimes when we're faced with fear, it's the, the adrenaline starts to pump and, the, and we lose sight of the things that we already know. And so he, he says here, since we cannot contract the absolute, we shall have to expand the relative. The infinite will not be or become less than itself. All we can do is accept that the being which we are is some part of the divine. To know this is to overcome fear. Whether this fear is of lack, pain, sickness, or death, it is always a belief, and there is something other than life, or that life withholds... I am a little tongue-tied today. It is always a belief that there is something other than life, or that life withholds pleasure, peace, success, or heaven from us. So he points us to this place where we can remember, we can know what we know. In, in the philosophy that we teach here, we begin to understand that there is a movement of the divine wisdom and intelligence that wants to express by means of us, and our job is to give it its head. That's an old horseback riding term. When you're riding a horse and, the, and you're starting to gallop, you want to give it its head. You want to allow it to move with you. So we we have our faith, we begin to remember what we know, and then he goes on to say, love alone can un- overcome fear because love surrenders itself to the object of its adoration. I love that. Love alone can overcome fear because love surrenders itself to the object of its adoration. The soul must make a complete surrender of itself to the spirit. That is, the law must come under sub- Subjection to the spirit. The will of the spirit is peace, clear thinking, and happiness. It could have no other will. So he's giving us these wonderful examples of how we can move through fear, how we can use fear to reach a higher understanding, to begin to deepen our faith and begin to tap into love. And it reminds me of how fear is the thing that wants to keep me in my comfort zone, but it is love and knowledge and faith and then the action that comes out of that that helps me walk out of fear and into my greater good. And I realize that sometime when we find ourselves retreating into our comfort zone, that it's a coping mechanism when we're not feeling safe. But I want to encourage you to, once you've got your bearings, to step back out of your comfort zone, to begin to push that growing edge and continue to look for ways where how you can expand yourself and you can be a, a larger repository and expression of spirit. The other um, piece I brought up here this morning is one of my favorite books. I think I've shared some of it with you in the past. It's by Stephen Cope, who is the director of the Kripala Institute um, over in, on the East Coast. And he wrote this book called The Great Work of Your Life, A Guide for the Journey to Your True Calling. And in it, he talks about and describes for us this opportunity that we have to realize our dharma. Now, the Hindus have this uh, tenet within their religion called dharma, and dharma is simply their word for fulfilling the highest expression of yourself. This sounds kind of familiar to what I was just talking about. 
opening ourselves up, allowing spirit to move through us with full expression. Well, that's what the Hindus call dharma. And there's a, one particular quote in here. The first time I had come across this, it's a, it's a quote from the Gospel of Thomas. And when you hear it, I think you'll see the relation to what we're talking about. In the Gospel of Thomas, it says, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. If you bring forth that what forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. And so what he's saying is that if we, if we stay small, if we stay in our, in our comfort zone, if we don't grow, we are depriving spirit of an experience of expansion and demonstration by means of us. And I think of it as the, if you, as if you think about it in gardening terms, and the, you have the ripe fruit that never gets picked. And what happens? It withers. It dies on the vine. And so our opportunity as we face change, as we look at this idea of leaving our comfort zone and um, stepping into transformation, which is a big word for stepping into our authenticity and who we have come here to be, that that is, that is answering the call to our dharma. Cope says there are, and he structures the whole book about this, he talks about ordinary people doing extraordinary things, and then we think of them as superstars. But they're just ordinary people doing extraordinary things because they're following their dharma. They're, they're walking out who it is they've meant to, they're meant to be. And he says there are four pillars to our dharma. The first one is to look towards our dharma. Holmes talks about it in that sense of, knowing and knowing what it is that we are here to do. And then his second pillar is to, to do it full out. And that's where we follow the intuitions within ourselves about what it is that we are here to do, what it is that we're here to express. Oftentimes that comes up as things that give you joy or spark your passion. The third pillar is to let go of the fruits if we let go of the fruit so that we are really in service to the greater good and not for the candy or the brass ring or the thing that we think we're going to get because we're good, <laughs> because we're doing something for that's altruistic. We're, we're trying to be extraordinary. No, we just need to be ordinary and do what we love. And the fourth pillar is to surrender to God and Holmes talks about that as faith, that opportunity to let us, to remind us that we are never alone in our work. We're never alone in walking out our dharma. And I thought I would share a little experience that I had recently. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of come back to a reading that I did. <laughs> come back. I come back to a reading that I did two weeks ago by Laura Lentz. And I wanted to share with you um, just a little vignette of how this has played out for me, how I have found and uh, heard the whisper of my dharma, and I have stayed true to it. I've continued to play with it in my mind. I've, I've held back a little bit. I haven't done anything about it. I've, I've maybe succumb to a little fear or busyness, so keep myself away from it. But how I didn't completely abandon it, and it came to me. So uh, I have been thinking that I uh, would like to do some writing, more than just what I write in my journal or writing a Sunday talk, but to really do some writing. And it's, it's been like a whisper of something that I that I should be doing. And so as I told you um, 
two weeks ago, I came across this beautiful writing, deep, beautiful writing by Laura Lentz. And, I, and if, you, if you're curious, go back on our YouTube or Facebook and you can watch the talk, where, or you can, you know, I can tell you where to find it. But it was this beautiful writing, this essay that she did about her, um, an old boyfriend who had passed away. And when I read it, I didn't, I don't know that I shared this with you, but when I read it, it was late at night. It was like, it was like 11.30 or 12 on a Saturday night. I had done, I had put together my talk and I had tucked it away. I was laid in bed and I was sort of relaxing, reading, doing some reading. And I read this reading by Laura Lentz and, and it, it cracked me open in a way that I hadn't been cracked open in a long time. And I began to weep. And then I was drawn to begin to write. And I spent about a half an hour just writing all this, these memories that I had about my ex-husband. And I think this is significant because when I was divorced and when my husband fell in love with someone else, that too cracked me open and it created a a great deal of change in a short period of time in my life because I chose to lean into the grief and I chose to allow it to lead me forward. But there was one interesting little byproduct about all of that. I couldn't remember my life with my ex-husband. I, I, it was like a big blank thing in my memory. I spent 33 years with him. And it was like I couldn't really, I couldn't grab, you know, the only evidence I felt like I had of that relationship was our two children. And I think that's one of the coping mechanisms that happens for us when we go through a great deal of pain. We find a way to kind of, you know, move through what we can and put the rest aside until we're ready to deal with it. And so I share this idea about writing for you and what came up for me is because after I read Laura's um, essay and after it cracked me open and I did a little writing, I did a little investigation and it turns out that she's a writing teacher. And she had a class coming up in just a few days. And I took her class. <laughs> and more beautiful awakenings came through me as I as I began to lean into this idea of writing under the guidance of her and her staff. And for me, when I share that, this was really how Dharma works for us. We, we, we have an idea, something that we feel, it's a whisper. Sometimes it's a shout, sometimes it jumps up and down in front of you and tries to get your attention. But we have this idea of something that we ought to be doing. We keep it, we, it scares us sometimes. We hold back, but we keep it somewhere close. And we continue to, to look for opportunities or at least don't resist it when it comes up. And so the experience I had of being very uncomfortable, but at the same time finding this sweetness of memories of my life with my ex-husband that came flooding back, that I, I had forgotten that I had put aside. Now, this is nine years ago, so apparently I'm strong enough to, to remember the, the, what we shared. I'm strong enough now to remember the things that we, that we had together. And so I thought I would share with you the little piece I wrote in the, with the writing prompt. The writing prompt was, uh, share a time when you had to love courageously. He didn't answer his phone or text messages. I knew where he was. I didn't want to believe it. Some part of me knew he was leaving, but I couldn't possibly understand what life would be like not being married to James. We had been together since before I was of legal age, and here I was, now entitled to the Blue Plate special discount for seniors, and he was leaving. We had grown so far apart over the years, and yet I was not ready to be left. We were so different, and over and over and over again, I would choose to love him. 
Love him when he chose to work instead of joining us for a family vacation. Love him when he chose to fall asleep in the living room over and over again instead of sharing our bed. Love him when he would gently love me and support me as I followed my passion for serving everyone in the world but him. Love him when he ate anything I cooked with gratitude. Love him when he went out of his way to make our life more comfortable. Love him when he took care of all the animals in our home with such grace, never complaining about the work. Love him when he took my neglect without a word of complaint. When he left, the act of loving him required that I shut the door in our life together. Like one day I was 22 and engaged, and the next day I was 55 and alone. I couldn't hate him, but I couldn't know him anymore either. Then one day, many, many days later, the floodgates opened, and I could see myself in all of this and forgive him. And when forgiveness came, I remembered who we were, who he was with me, and I could appreciate who I am because of him. And it all started, this all came out of me because I was willing to weep and to feel the pain and to feel the joy and to feel the bittersweetness that that discomfort came with. It was a package deal. So the next time that you are feeling a little bit of discomfort, the next time that something comes up that, that you're not sure you really want to lean into, it looks a little hairy and... I invite you to drop down into a place of at least pause to check out your resistance, to see what might be here for you, what might want to come through you, what dharma might be whispering your name so that you too can live all out and be the most authentic expression of you that there is. Thank you very much. Okay, let's pray. Yeah, just take a deep breath. And notice how the breath when we consciously take a breath, it can open us up. It can open our lungs up. It can open our chest. And releasing it can allow us to feel the spaciousness of spirit within our body temple. And so I know as we move through this week, as we continue on this path of love, if we continue on this path of of caring for one another, of being present, of sharing not only our own lives, but our, the lives of each other in this amazing country that we live in. Knowing our wholeness, even when we feel broken. And so as I speak this word, it, I know that it is a word of, of courage of openness, of heightened awareness, that we are willing, willing to be so self-aware of what it is that's ours to do in the moment, of what it is that's ours to lean into, knowing that we are always supported, that there is a movement of spirit. It is a motion of love through our lives. And so I know for each one that we accept that love we allow it to move through us, to express by us, so that we can walk out our dharma, so that we can be that beautiful, potent expression of spirit in all that we do. And so it is with gratitude that I know the each one of us is sourced. I know that each one of us is guided, guarded, and protected. I know that each one of us is like a flower blossoming on a sunny day, allowing spirit to have its way with our life. I give great thanks for this. 
I call it good and very good. And together we anchor this prayer by saying together, and so it is. And 